the shadow before they began the perfection the perfections are sharpened and flowers spreads its coloured purples void in the sun but the tongue of the bee misses them they sink back into the loom crying out you may call it a cry that creeps over them a shiver as they wilt and disappear william carlos williams patterson boom down in a dead man's town bruce springsteen chapter one after the flood 1957 one the terror which would not end for another 28 years if it ever did end began so far away as i know or can tell with a boat made from a sheet of newspaper floating down a gutter swollen with rain a boat bobbed listed righted itself again and dived bravely through treacherous whirlpools and continued on its way down Whitcham Street towards the traffic light which marked the intersection of Whitcham and Jackson the three vertical lenses on all sides of the light at traffic light were dark this afternoon the fall of 1957 houses were all dark too there had been steady rain for a week now and two days ago the winds had come as well most sections of Derry had lost their power then and it was not back on yet a small boy in a yellow slicker and red goloshes ran cheerfully along beside the newspaper boat the rain was not stopped but it was finally slackening it tapped on the yellow hood, hood on the boy's sticker, sounding onto his ears like a rain on a shed roof. A comfortable, almost cosy sound. The boy in the yellow sticker was George Denborough. He was six, his brother William, known to most of the kids as a Derry Emerald School, and even to the teachers, who would never have used his nickname to his face, a stuttering Bill, was at home, hacking out the last, the nasty case of influenza. In the autumn of 1957, eight months before the real world was began, and 28 years before the final showdown, starting Bill was just ten years old. Bill was made the boat beside which George now ran. He made it sitting up in bed, his back propped against a pile of pillows, while their mother played for Elsie on the piano in the parlour, and rain swept right asleep against his bedroom window. About three quarters of the way down the block, the one headed towards the intersection, a dead traffic light, which charm street was blocked to the motor traffic by smudge pots and four orange saw horses, stenciled each across each other, the horses was Dappy Dairy Depot of Public Works. Department of Public Works. Beyond them, the rain has spilled out of the gutters, clogged with branches and rocks and big sticky piles of autumn leaves. The wall had, f- had first peered finger holes in the paving and then snatched the whole greeny handfuls. All this on the third day of the rains. By noon on the fourth day, big chunks of the street surfaces were boating through the intersections of Jackson and Whitcomb. A miniature whitewash water rafts. By that time, many people in Derry had begun to make nervous jokes about arcs. The Public Works Department had managed to keep Jackson Street open, with Whitcham was impassable from the sea sources all the way to the centre of the town. But everyone agreed the worst was over. The King Kendusterg stream had crested just below its banks, the barrens of bare inches below the concrete sides of the canal, which channelled it tightly as it passed through downtown. Right now, a gang of men, Sack, Denborough, George and F- Bill's father, among them, were removing the sandbags they were thrown up the day before. With much, such hasty, panicky haste, yesterday overflow, expensive flood damage had seemed almost inevitable. God knew it had happened before. A flood in 1931 had been a disaster which had cost millions of dollars, almost two and almost two dozen lives. That was a long time ago. There were still enough people around who remembered it to scare the rest. One of the, f- one of the flood victims had been found 25 miles east in black spot. A fish had eaten his unfortunate gentleman's eyes, three of his fingers, his penis, and most of his left foot clutched in what remained of his hands in a full so- steering wheel. Now through the river was seeding and when the young new 
Bangor Hydro Dam went in upstream, the river would cease to be a threat. Or so said Zach Dembara, who worked at the Bangor Hydroelectric. As for the rest, well, future floods would take care of themselves. And one thing was to get through this one, to get the power back on, and then to forget it. A very such forgetting of tragedy and disaster was almost an art, as Bill Denborough would come to discover in the course of time. George pools just below the sea horses at the edge of the deep ravine had been cut through the tar surfaces which couldn't treat. The ravine ran up to them almost to the exact diagonal, the end of the far side of the street, roughly forty feet further down the hill from where he now stood on the right. He laughed aloud the sound of solitary, childish glee at a bright runner in that grey afternoon. A vagary of the furring water took his hope of boat to the small gale rapids and which now formed by the break in tar. The urgent water had cut a ch- canal, canal, which ran along the diagonal, and so his boat travelled from one side to Wickham Street, the other, the current carrying on it so fast that George had to sprint to keep up with it. Water sprayed out from beneath his glasses and muddy sheets. The buckles made a jolly jigging. As George Denbury ran towards his death, his strange death, and the feeling w- which filled him, a moment was clear and simple love for his brother Bill. Love and a touch of regret that Bill couldn't be there here to see and be part of it. Of course, he would try to describe it to Bill when he got home, but he knew he wouldn't be able to make Bill see it. Why Bill would have been able to make him see it if the positions had been reversed. Bill was good at reading and writing. Not, but even at his age, George was wise enough to know that it wasn't the only reason why Bill got ways in his football cards or why his teachers liked his composition so well. Tanning was both only part of it. Bill was good at seeing. A boat ne- nearly whistled along the Daniel Channel just at the dawn for a classified section of Derry News. But now George imagined it as a PT boat, the war movie, like the ones he sometimes saw down at Derry Theatre, with Bill as Saturday Matinoids, a war picture of John Moy fighting the Japs, a prowl of the newspaper boat, through sprays of water to either side of it, rushed along, and it reached the gutter of the left side of Witcham Street, a fresh third streamlet rushed over the break in the tar at this point, creating a fairly large whirlpool. It seemed to him that the boat must be swamped and capsized. He leaned in, leaned in army, and George cheered as it righted itself, turned and went racing down towards his intersection. George went to catch up. Over his head, a grim gust of October wind rattled in trees, now almost completely unburdened by their freight of coloured leaves by the storm, which had been this year a reaper the most ruthless sort. Sitting up in bed, his cheeks still flushed with the feet, but his fever, like the kinder dusk lick, finally receding. Bill had finished the boat, but when George reached for it, Bill held it out of reach. Nah, you get me the p- 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 petroleum, p- p- paraffin. What? What's that? What is it? Oh, it's on the search. Self as you go downstairs, Bill said. In a box that says golf, bring that to me, and a knife, and a b- b- bowl, and p- 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 pack of m- 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 matches. George had gone to Bailey to get these things. He could hear his mother playing the piano. Not for Elsie now, but something else he didn't like so well. Something that sounded dry and fussy. He could hear rain flicking suddenly against the wind- kitchen windows. Comfortable sounds, but the thought of the cellar was not a bit comfortable. He did not like the cellar. He did not like going down the cellar stairs, because he always imagined there's something down there in the dark. That was silly, of course. His father said so. His mother said so. And even more important, Bill said so. But still, even not even like, like opening the door, a flick of light, because he always had the idea. This is as critically stupid. He didn't dare tell anyone that while he was holding a fiddle of a light switch, some horrible poor Claude Paul was so lightly over his wrist and jerk him down in the darkness the smell of dirt and wet and dim rotten vegetables. Stupid. No such thing, no things of claws, all hairy and full of killer spite. Even now, and someone went crazy and killed a lot of people, 
something Chet Hanley told about such things on the evening news. Of course, there were copies, but there was no weird amounts of living down in the cellar. And so still this idea lingered. In those intimate moments, while he was groping on the switch, with his hand, right hand, his left hand curled around the door jam, the death trap, the cellar smell seemed to intensify to fill the world. Spells of dirt and wet and long gone vegetables would merge into one unmistakable infant, inelectable smell, the smell of the monster, the perfidies of all monsters. It was a smell of something which was had he had no name, the smell of it. It crouched and lurking and ready to spring. A creature would could eat something, but which was extremely hungry for boy meat. He would open the door in the morning and grope immediately that morning and immediately intermediately and terminally for the switch holding a jab in his usual death grip his eyes squinted shut the tip of his tongue poked with the corner of his mouth like an analyzed rootlet searching for water in a place a drought funny sure you better look it look at look at you georgie georgie scared of the dark what a baby santa panel came from his father called the living room and that his father called his mother called him the parlor Sounding like music from another world, far away the way he talk of oh, laughter on some crowded beach might sound to exhausted swimmer who struggles with an undertone. Your fingers found the switch, ah, then snapped it, and nothing, no power. Oh, quite the power. George snatched his arm back as if from a basket filled with snakes. He stepped back from the open door to the door, his arm hurrying to his chest. The power was out, of course. He had forgotten the power was out. Jeezy Crow, what now? Go back and tell Bill you wouldn't get the box of paraffin because the power was out. He was afraid that something might get him. He stood on the cellar of the stairs. Something that wasn't a commie or mass murderer, but a creature much worse than either. What a what would simply silver pass be rotten itself out of up between the stair risers and grab its angle. What would go over big, wouldn't it? Others might laugh at such a fancy, but Bill wouldn't laugh. Bill would be mad. Bill would say, Grow up, Georgie. Do you want this boat or not? As he thought, they were, at this fault, where is Q? Bill called up for the bedroom. Do, do you die, d- die out there, d- 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 Georgie? No, I'm getting it, Bill. Georgie called back at once. He rubbed his arm, trying to make the guilty goose flesh disappear. He smoothed skin. Again, I just stopped to drink a water, uh, get a drink of water. Well, hurry up. Again, he walked down the four steps and set up shelf. His heart, a, a warm beating ammo in his throat. A hair his neck, on his neck, standing attention. His eyes got hot, his hands cold. Sure, any moment of sudden door was swing shut on his own, closing off the white light falling through the kitchen windows. Then we'd hear it, something worse than all the comedies and murderers in the world, worse than the Japs, worse than the Italian Leon, worse than something of his hundred warm, hundred horror movies. It's growling deeply. You could hear the growl in the lunatic seconds before it pounced him and zipped his guts. The cellar smell was worse than never, ever today because of the flood. The house is high in Wickdom Street, near the crest of the hill, and escaped the worst, but it's still standing in order down there, and it seeped through the old rock foundations. The smell was low, unpleasant, making him want to take only a shallow breath. George shifted through the junk on shelf as fast as he could. Old cans of creamy, saw punished, saw punished gag rags, a broken kerosene lamp, two mostly empty bottles of wax, window necks, an old flat can of total wax. For some reason, he's, he's, this can struck him. He spent nearly 30 seconds looking at total and the lid, a kind of inebriate wonder. Then he tossed it back, and here it was, a square box of world golf on it. George snatched it and ran out the stairs as fast as he could. Suddenly where his shirt curl was out, and suddenly sure his shirt curl would be his undoing, the thing that in the cellar would allow him to get away, all the way out, and when he would grab the tail of his shirt and snatch him back, and he reached the kitchen, swept the door shut behind him, and banged gustily. He leaned back in 
against it with his eyes closed. Quick popped out his arms and forehead and pelts a pair of him. Quick tightly in one hand. The piano has come to a stop and his bum voice floated to him. Georgie, can you can you slam the door a little harder next time? Maybe you could break some of the plates on the world's treasure if you really tried. Sorry, ma'am, he called back. Georgie, you're what you what you waste. Billy spilled set in the bedroom. He pitched his voice so that the mother could not hear. Georgie snickered a little. He feels was already gone. It had slipped away from him as easy as a nightmare slips away from a man awakes, cold skin and grasping for a grip who fills his body and stares, surrenders to make sure that none of what happened who begins at once to forget it. Arthur's by, gone by the time his feet fit the floor. Three quarters of it all the time he emerges from the shower and begins to towel off. All by the time he finishes his breakfast, all gone, till the next time, when, in the grip of a nightmare, all the fears will be remembered. That turtle, George thought, going to count the draw before the matches were kept. Where did I see a turtle like that before? No answer came, and he dismissed the question. He put a pack of matches from the drawer, knife in the rack, holding the sharp edge so seriously, waving his body as his dad had taught him, and a small bowl from the Welsh dresser in the dining room. He went back into Bill, Bill's room. Whoa, oh, I how oh, you are, to t- George, Bill said, Emily, enough, pushed back some of the sick stuff up his nose, night table. Empty glass of pitch of water, Kleenex, books at the bottom, a bottle of Vicks vapor rub, a smell which Bill was associated with his life was thick, plump. Flem, che, flemmy chest and snotty nose. The old pillicose radio was there, too plain, not shuffling or bark, but a little Richard too. Very softly, however, so softly that Richard was robbed of all his raw elemental power. Their mother had studied classical piano at Gillard. Hated rock and roll, she did not merely disliked it, she abominated it. I'm no a hole, George said, sitting on the edge of Bill's bed and putting the things he had gathered up, gathered on the night table. Yes, you are, Bill said. Nothing but a great big brown a hole, that's you. George tried to imagine a kid. Nothing but a great big a hole on legs. I began to giggle. Your a high hole is bigger than Augusta, Bill said, beginning to giggle too. Your a hole is bigger than the whole state, George replied. This, this boat. Broke both boys up in nearly two minutes. They have followed a whispered conversation of salt, which means very little to anyone save little small boys. The accurations of two. Who was the biggest a hole? Who had the biggest a hole? Which a hole was the brownest? And so on. Funny Bill said one of the forbidden words. He accused Jules of being a big brown shitty a hole. They both got, uh, got laughing hard. Bill's offer turned into a coffee fit, and he finally ran the tape were off. By then, Bill's face had gone a plummy shade, which Bill George regarded with some alarm. Then the funny piano stopped again. They both looked in the direction of the parlour, listening to the piano bench to scrape back, listening to their mother's impatient footsteps. Bill buried his mouth in the crook of his elbow, stifling the last of the coughs, pointing at the picture at the same time. George piled up with him a glass of water and ran, which he drank off. The piano began once, began once more. Farewell, see you again. Stuttering Bill never forgot that piece, and even though many years later he never failed to find a goose flesh in his arms and back, his heart would drop when he would remember. My mother was playing that day. Georgie died. You're going to cough any more, Bill? No. Bill pulled a Kleenex from his box, made a scrumbling sound in his chest, spat plectrum, phlegm into the tissue, Picked it, screwed it up, and tossed it into the waste basket by his bed, which was filled with similar twists of tissue. He opened it, the box of paraffin, and dropped waxy cuba stuff in his palm. George watched him closely, without speaking or questioning. Bill didn't like George talking to him while he did stuff, but George had learned he kept his mouth shut. Bill was usually explaining what he was doing. He Bill used his knife to cut off a small piece of paraffin in the cube. He put the piece in the bowl, then struck a match and put it on the top of the paraffin. Two boys watched a small yellow frame as a dying wind drove rain against the window in the cage of spares. Got the two waterproof the boat 
or it will just wet, get wet and sink. Bill said, when he, he was with Bill Jules, he stuttered with light. Sometimes he didn't stutter at all. It's cool, however, it could be so bad that talking would become impossible for him. Communication would cease, and Bill's school mates would look somewhere else while Bill clutched his sides of his desk, his face glowing almost as red as air. His eyes squeezed in the slits as he tried to winch some word out of his stubborn throat. Sometimes, most times, a word would come. Other times it simply refused. He'd often been hit by he had been a bit of a car when he was free and not the side of his building. He remained, remained, in, remained, he remained unconscious for seven hours. Mum said it was an accident which caused the stutter. Jules sometimes got the feeling that his dad, Bill himself, was not so sure. A piece of paraffin in the bell was almost entirely melted. The flame, match flame gutted lower, growling boo as it ugged the cardboard stick and went, then went out. Bill dipped his finger in the slit. We jerked it out with thin fingers. He smiled apologetically at the George. Oh, he said. After a few seconds, he dipped his finger in again and began to smear the wax along the sides of the boat. Where is it? Quickly dried on milky haze. Can I do, do some? George asked. Okay. Just don't get any on the blankets or Mum will kill you. George dripped his finger in the paraffin, which is now very warm, but not low on got hot. We then spread it along to the other side of the boat. Don't put it on so much, you a-hole, he said, Bill said. You want to sink it on his maiden, maiden cruise? I'm oh, sorry. That's all right. Just go, go easy. George finished the other side and felt his boat in his hands. He felt a little heavier, but not much. Too cool, he said. I want to go out and sell it. Yeah, you can do that, Bill said. So he looked tired and tired and still not very well I wish you could come Joe said he really did Bill sometimes got bossy after a while but he always had the coolest ideas and he hardly ever hit it's your boat really she Bill said you call boats she see them I wish I could come too Bill said groanly well George shifted one foot to the other both his hands you put it on your rain stuff Bill said Oh, you wind up with a flu, like me. Probably catch it anyway, for my germs. Thanks, Bill. It's a neat boat, and we said something he didn't, hadn't done for a long time. Something Bill never forgot. He leaned over and kissed his brother's neck. You'll catch it from sure now, you are old, Bill said. He seemed cheered up all the time. He smiled at George. Put all that stuff back, too, or Mum will get a, have a b- b- bird. Sure, he gathered up the waterproof equipment and chased across the room and bur- perched for grocery on top of the paraffin box, which is a skew and a little bowl. Georgie, Georgie turned back to look at his brother. Be, be careful. Sure, he brow well, ceased a little. There was something your mum, there was something your mum said. Not your big brother. It was strange uh, as it, him giving Bill a kiss. Sure, Bill. He went out. Bill never saw him again. From the here, now he, he was chasing down the side of the witch street, running fast, but the water was running faster. His boat was filled on his head. He heard a deepening roar and saw the fifty yards further down the hill water in the gutter was castigating a strain dorm. It was still open. It was a long, dark semicircle into the curbing. As as George watched the strip march, it barked as dark as glistening as seal, seal skin shot in the snow, snow, storm drains mall. It hung up there by a moment and then looked down, down inside. There was his boat and was headed. Oh shit! And showing her, he yelled his maid. He put on the speed, and for a moment he thought he would patch the boat. Then one of his feet slipped. He went spilling, skinning one knee and crying in pain. From his new pavement level perspective, he watched his boat swing down almost, uh, round twice, momently caught in another whirlpool, then disappear. Shit! And Shilona, he yelled, he yelled again, and slammed his feet down on the pavement. That hurt too. He began to cry a little. What a stupid way to lose the boat. He got out and walked over to the storm drain. He dropped to his knees and peered in. The water made a dank, hollow sound as he fell to the darkness. It was a spooky sound. It reminded him of 
Huh, the sound was jerked out of him. I don't know if the string had been cold. There was a yellow eyes in there. The sort of eyes he'd always imagined, but never really seen in the basement. It was an animal, he thought, invariably. That's all it was. It is some animal, maybe a house cat. I got stuck at that in there. Still, he was ready to run. Would run a second or two when his mental switch were were dealt with a shock. Those two shiny yellow eyes had given him. He felt the rough surface of the vendor dam under his fingers and a sheen thin sheet of cold water flowing around them. He saw himself getting up and backing away, and then there, and that was that when a voice, a perfectly reasonable a rather pleasant voice, no. spoke to him from inside a stone drain. No. Hi, Georgie, it said. No. Georgie blinked and looked again. He could barely no. credit what he saw. No. It was something like he made up a story no. or a movie where you know the animals no. would talk and dance. No. If he had been ten years older, he would not have believed what he was seeing. He was not sixty, he was six. There was a clown in a stone drain. No. The night in there was a fur from good. But it's good enough so that George Denbury no. was sure he was seeing it was a clown, like in a circus on TV. In fact, he looked like a cross between Bonzo, Clara Well, Bell, and a talk by honking. He saw her. George was never really sure of the gender. All the honky doodly Saturday mornings. Buffalo Bill about, was just about the only one who called, I understand, called by, and always cracked George up. The face of the clown in the storm train was white. There were funny twists of red hair on either side of his bald head. There was a big clown smile painted over his mouth. He'd always have been inhabiting a, a, late, a year later. He would surely have thought Ronald McDonald for Bonzo or Clarida Bell. A clown held a bunch of blues, all colours like gorgeous white fruit in one hand. The other, he hailed George's of a newspaper boat. What's your boat? What? You, your boat, Georgie? The clown smoked, smiled. Georgie smiled back. He couldn't help it. He was a kind of smile you had to answer. I sure do, he said. Georgie, the clown laughed. I sure do. That's good. That's very good. And now, how about a balloon? Well, sure, he reached forward. Then drew his hand reluctantly back. I'm not supposed to talk to st- Take stuff for strangers. My dad said so. Very wise of your dad, the clown said. His dame drawn said. Smiling, no. ow! No. Georgie wondered, could I have thought, thought his eyes were going yellow? A bright, dancing blue, the colour of his son's no. eyes and bills. Very wise indeed, therefore, I will introduce myself, Georgie. I am Mr. Bob Gray, also no. known as Pennywise, the dancing clown. Pennywise, meet George Denbury. George, meet Pennywise. Now we know each other. I'm not a stranger to you, and you're not a stranger to me. Can it? Can it? George giggled, I guess so. He reached forward and drew his hand back again. How did you get down there? Storm just blew me away, Pennywise, the dancing clown said. It blew the whole circus away. Can you smell the circus, Georgie? Georgie leaped forward. Suddenly you could smell peanuts. Hot roasted peanuts and vinegar. A white kind you put on your french fries for a hole in the cap. You could smell cotton candy and frying donut boys. And the faint but thunderous odour of that wild animal shit. You could smell the cheeky aroma midway for sounds, sawdust, and yet, and yet, all it was all the smell of flood and closing leaves and dark stained storm drain shadows. It smells wet and rotten, the cellar smell. But the other smells were stronger. You bet I can smell it, he said. Want your boat, Georgie? Pennywise asked. I can only repeat myself because you really do not seem that eager. He held up a smiling. He's wearing a saggy belt, saggy silk shirt, suit with bright, giant, big orange buttons, a bow tie, electric blue, flopped down his front. His hands were big white gloves, like the kind Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck always wore. Yes, yeah, sure, Georgie said, looking in his strange room. And a balloon? I've got red and green, yellow and blue. Do they float? Float the clown? Grin widened. Oh, yes, indeed they do. They float. And there's cousin candy. Georgie reached. The clown seized his arm. And George saw the clown's face change. What he saw was terrifying enough to make his first imagine into the thing in the cellar. Looked like sweet dreams. What he saw was destroyed his sanity in one clawing stroke. They float, the thing in his drain crooned, a clotted, chucking voice. 
It held George's arm in a thick and wormy grip. It pulled George towards the terrible darkness, where the water rushed and roared and bellowed. It bore its cargo of storm debris towards the sea. George craned his neck away from the final blackness and began to scream. To rain, to scream mildly, the water will to white autumn of the sky, which curled away above Derry on that day in the fall of 1957. His screams were shrill and piercing, and then all stood up down a week of street. Beat. People came to their windows and all bought it out, out into the porches. They float, he growled. They float. Georgie, they all, they all down here with me. You'll float too. Georgie's shoulders shot between the cement of the curb and David Garner who had stayed home for his job at the Stubot that day because of the rotor saw only a small boy a yellow rain sticker a small boy was screaming and rivering in the gutter with muddy, muddy water surfing under his face making his screams sound bubbly everything down here floats so that chuckling rotten voice whispered and suddenly there was a rippling noise of flowing street of agony she and me and George Denbury knew no more. David Gardner was the first to get there. Although he arrived only 50, 45 seconds before the first scream, George Denbury was already dead. George Gardner grabbed him by the back of his sticker, pulled him out in the street and began to scream himself as George's body turned over in his hands. The other side of George's sticker was bright red. Blood flowed from the slave drum, but a tattered hole and from the left arm had been left. A lump of bone, horribly bright, pecked from the torn cloth. A bird in his eyes stared up the white sky as David as Dave staggered away towards the others, already raining pelt mill down the street. They began to fill up with rain. Somewhere below in the cell drum, it was already filled nearby capacity runoff. There had been no one down there. The country sheriff who would later claim the Derry newspaper, the frustrated ferry, so great, humorous agony. Hercules himself would have been swept away in a drain, driving current. George newspaper sh- boat shot onward through night chambers, long concrete hallways, and roared and chimed through the water. For a while it ran neck and neck with a dead chicken. Where it floated his yellowy reptile toes, pointed at the dripping ceiling. Then, some junction east of the town, the chicken was swept off to the left, while George's boy went straight. An hour later, while George's mother was already sedated in the emergency room, Derry Home Hotel Hospital, while Stuckman Bill sat stunned and white and silent in his bed, listening to his father stop hoarsely in the parlour where his mother had been playing for Elsie, where George went out the shot the boat shot out through a concrete loophole like a bullet. It sized in the muzzle of the gun and ran at speed down the stairway into an unnamed stream where it joined the boiling, swollen Pendlecott River. Twenty minutes later, the first rift of blue began to show the sky overhead. The storm was over. A boat dripped and a swayed and something took on sometimes took on water. We did not sink. The two brothers had walked it very well. I don't know where it finally fetched up, it, if it ever did. Perhaps it's reached the sea and sails lie there forever like a magic boat in a fairy tale. All I know is that it's still afloat and still running on the breast of the flood as it passed the incorporate town, limits of dairy, Maine, and then it passes out to its, of its tail forever.